So uh, um, we were both studying in Würzburg and um, I got lost in the lab and uh, Judith did not get lost but she got into the field and she did really extremely hard work in the field. I thought always, wow, she, she must have the stamina of mon multiple males basically. She's really great, she does a lot of uh, excellent field work but then eventually they went and got into the genomics of kind of termites as well. Her work is always, as I think, uh, characterized. She kind of takes straightforward questions, uh, takes what it uh, works and takes what it needs to answer those questions, even if it's hard. And uh, she's now at the University of Freiburg since two years, I think, and trying to rescue that institute and make it to one of the centers of termite research. And so without further ado, Judith Korp. I'm looking forward. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I hope I will get my talk also. Yeah, so thanks very much for the very kind introduction and also for inviting me here to give this talk. And it's a real pleasure um, to tell you something about termites, which are some of the other social insects, which are often kind of neglected. So termites are actually social cockroaches, a monophyletic clade nested within, within the Platodea. And they are grouped normal oops, and okay. um, and this different ancestry you can already see like when you look in detail into the colonies of termite colonies compared to social hymenopteran colonies. So um, as, social as social cockroaches, termites are characterized by having both sexes within the colony, so they have a king and a queen. They have male and female soldiers and fe male and female workers. And as cockroaches, they are diploid, not haplodiploid, and they are hemimetabolous insects, which means actually that all the, all the workers are larval instars, not adults. And this really makes a huge difference in many aspects when you compare termites and, cock and, and um, social hymenoptera. So um, termites are normally um, classified into seven families with the phylo where the phylogenetic um, position of some of the families is not very clear yet. So the first six families are then characterized or also called lower termites and then one family, the termitide, which make up more than 70% of all recent termites are also called higher termites. The termites are also classified according to their life type into two major life types. And one are the multiple piece nesting termites, or I used to call them foraging termites. And these are most of the recent species. And these are all the termites you are probably most familiar with. They build large mounds and they have a nest that is separate from uh, their food source. So they are always central place foragers. And then there is another group of termites, which are called one-piece nesting termites, or I used to call them wood-dwelling termites. And these termites, they sit in a, within a piece of wood, which serves as food and shelter, and which the termites never leave to forage outside the nest. So um, this is what they, they looks like. And our study species, Cryptothermus secundus from Australia, actually belongs to this wood-dwelling um, termite species. And um, why is it interesting um, to study this species? I actually um, on purpose choose this species um, because this wood-dwelling life type is um, supposed to be the ancestral life type because it is shared um, with the sister taxon of the termites, the wood roaches. And another um, nice thing about this wood-dwelling termites is that they are very flexible in their development. So um, 
the individuals, so all workers are actually totipotent larval instars, and they can then develop into dispersing alates um, that found new nests as so-called primary reproductive, and in between there are so-called nymphal instars, these are instars with wing buds, whereas the larval instars are instars without wing bud. And um, these, um, this development um, between larval and nymphal instars can also be regressed, which is something unique within the whole animal kingdom that you can regress your development. But these workers can also um, become um, reproductive within the natal nest. Um, when the current queen, queen or king dies, they can take over the, uh, the position and then inherit um, the position as a so-called neotenic replacement reproductive. The workers can also develop into soldiers. These soldiers are sterile and they defend the colony. So we have a high plasticity there, there and um, I thought it is very interesting because then we can actually look why do termites cooperate. Um, so then we said like when the termites as workers are staying in the nest, um, they cooperate and when they develop into winged sex cells, they do not cooperate. And I won't go into detail into um, this research and just summarize you um, some of the results um, that we found. So what we could show with our work is actually that all workers are really um, potential uh, kings and queens. And really, um, I think if they are not becoming a soldier, which are just really few individuals in our species, just two or three um, individuals, then they actually become sooner or later within their lifetime, um, they become a king or a queen. And either uh, they become a new founding queen or they inherit the colony. And whether, um, whether they stay in the colony as worker or not is dependent on the conditions at home. So the most important is um, the food availability, so how big the tree is and how much they have eaten up the tree, and the colony size and also parasite load. Okay, what I'm going to show you then um, is um, how is actually, so we are shifting now from the ultimate why questions to the how questions about the mechanism. And what we were getting interested in is then actually how this reproductive monopoly is maintained within the colony. Because actually when all the workers are potential kings and queens, so how can a queen um, maintain the reproductive monopoly? And um, associated with this question is then how is the development of these individuals regulated when they are so plastic. And um, so we were investigating or still investigating that at the endocrine and the genetic level and um, looking here for communication um, aspects. Um, and in the second part of my talk, I will then show um, how our results for Cryptotherma secundus compares with um, other termites for which we have genetic information. Okay, so how is this developmental plasticity within the termites um, regulated? So we have many more molting types than what you have in another insects in these lower termites. And I will concentrate on the aspects of developing into primary reproductive and neotenic reproductive. Soldiers have been studied or are being studied intensively um, by several people and there's a recent review um, about soldier development by Miura and Schaaf um, in, the, in our recent termite book. So I will concentrate first on um, the endocrine regulation of this plasticity. When you look um, from a larval instar that is going to become an alate, we have in our species like fünf, uh, five nymphal instars and what you can see, um, the juvenile hormone titter in the larval instars is very high and it drops within the, um, when you go through a nymphal instar. Um, but actually within the nymphal instars, there's actually some variation um, in the plasticity during the molting interval of an individual and you can see this here. Um, this is all work done that was in, done in uh, cooperation with Klaus Hartfelder. So all the measurements of the JH titer are actually um, Klaus measurements. And um, so there's quite some variation. And then when you go then have the imaginal volt into the um, L8, um, 
then you can actually see that uh, the juvenile ho hormone titer is then really increasing uh, in the reproducing individuals. And we can summarize this juvenile hormone um, titer during development in the following graph. So you have here a larval instars. When this larval worker instars then um, becomes a nymphal instars, the tr uh, JH titer drops. It varies, um, but um, it is low before the next um, progressive mold into the next nymphal instars. Then directly after the mold, the JH titer increases again, and so it gradually gets down. And then the penultimate nymphal instars, the fourth nymphal instars, is actually characterized by, the, by a shortened intermold period. Then there comes the fifth nymphal instars, and then um, this, this is characterized by a JH peak before the actual adult mold, and then it decreases again directly after the mold, and then when the individuals start reproducing, the JH titer increase again. And when we now look for the neogenic um, development of the individual, actually all these individuals, the larvae and all the nymphal instars can actually become uh, neogenic um, reproductives that inherit the colony, and um, this development is actually characterized mainly by a shortened intermold period and then a dramatic increase in the JH titer. So this means that JH is um, probably very influ influential in, in, um, in this development and associate and uh, it increases um, dramatically um, when an individual becomes a reproductive. And associated with the shift to becoming a reproductive is also a shift in the scent of the um, reproductive. So um, like in other social insects, um, the queen, there is a queen specific um, scent which is characteri characterized by long chain particular hydrocarbons. And you can see here a chromatogram um, with the retention time uh, above for a queen and below for a worker. And all these um, peaks here are long chain particular hydrocarbons that are specific for queens and that are lacking in workers. So they are all uh, uh, indicated by this open circle. So, and on the opposite, we have very few worker specific particular hydrocarbons. They are characterized by this um, filled circles. And when one looks in detail um, into the chemical composition of the scent, one can see um, that. Um, the queens are characterized by long chain particular hydrocarbons, and they can be um, either alke alkanes or alkenes, and they can be either methylated or non methylated. So, um, what is now the major difference between a worker and the neotenic reproductive? So, we have seen that the neotenic reproductive smells differently, she has a queen um, smell and um, she also has an increased JH titer. And, but the only difference actually uh, between a worker and a re neotenic reproductive is uh, that the individual is reproducing. So a worker is developing via a single mold into a ne neotenic reproductive without developing eyes or developing wings. And um, so this um, made us thought that this would be a good study system to compare really workers with neotenic females to um, identify genes which are important for reproduction and maintaining the reproductive monopoly. Because we would not see genes that are associated with wing development or eye development when you look at primary reproductive. And this is then actually um, what we did. We wanted to identify queen genes. This is more than, um, more than 10 years ago. This was more than 10 years ago. And at this time, we didn't have much genetic resources. So what we used was a so-called representational difference analysis um, where we could identify genes which are highly overexpressed in, in neotenic females compared um, to workers. And with this method, we um, identified or found five genes, which we called NeoFem for neotenic female and then one to five. And the first one is an esterase lipase, then a beta-glucosidase, and um, NeoFem3 is a vitalogenin then a P450 of the ZIP4 family, and then a gene, um, NeoFem4, which is unknown and is still unknown. So this is kind of an orphan gene. 
And um, in the next step, we then also wanted to characterize the functionality of these genes, and we actually started with the NeoFilm2 with this better glu um, glucosidase. And what we did um, was RNA interference, um, so we knocked down um, this NeoFilm2 um, gene, and here you can see um, that this RNA interference experiment was, was successful. So you see here the concentration of NeoFilm2 in normal queens, then in the knockdown, and then in a control where we use, con use control as iRNA, and when we just injected solvent. So this means um, that the knockdown was working fine. And then at the same time, we looked at the behavioral patterns within the colony. And what we recognized that was that the queen didn't change her behavior at all. But um, the, the workers changed their behavior, and uh, especially one specific behavior, and this is the butting behavior. And they only did this um, in our uh, treatment where we knocked down NeoFilm2. So um, they increased the butting beha behavior after silencing um, this gene. And this was very um, nice for us and very surprising for us um, because um, we already know this butting behavior from, from another experiment. Um, actually, when we have colonies without queens, then this budding behavior is, is increasing. So this budding behavior we uh, know now is um, really indicating um, that the queens are not recognizing the queen anymore and think they are, that they are sitting in a queenless colony. And uh, those individuals which do most budding are actually the ones that become the new replacement um, kings and queens. So these results then indicated to us that actually NeoFem2 is um, very important um, in maintaining the reproductive monopoly of the colony. So it seemed to be a crucial queen gene in this germline. So what is actually NeoFem2? NeoFem2 uh, Neo is a beta glucosidase, and as a beta glucosidase, it is a common um, digestive enzyme in many organisms. Um, in cockroaches, where the termites belong to, it is um, also involved in, in the communication um, of, um, during mating be ma between males and females. And actually, this was the reason why I chose to first knock down NeoFem2, because we actually thought that it might be involved in the chemical communication, but it wasn't. Um, so then, um, it's just a green chain uh, gene, but it's not involved in the particular hydrocarbon pattern, which we check. So therefore, we then went on and um, tested um, a next candidate, which is NeoFem4. And NeoFem4 is a P450 gene, um, which are also known to be involved first in, um, in regulation of um, JH titers and also they are also known to be involved in um, the um, uh, biosynthesis of particular hydrocarbons. And so we did the same thing as we did with NeoFem2. Um, so we silenced the gene, and um, you can see here as well that the silencing was um, successful. So we could knock down the NeoFem4 gene, then we did again the behavioral experiments, we're not showing you any um, for, uh, any graphs, but this was also the same result as like for the NeoFem2 gene, so the, work, the queen didn't change her behavior, um, but the workers behaved as if they were in a greenless colony. And what we did at the same time was also looking for the particular hydrocarbon patterns, and this time we actually um, were successful. What you can see here are the results of a principal component analysis of 24 um, compounds from the particular hydrocarbon profile. And um, so what you see here is um, the open circles are the queen, the unmanipulated queen, and uh, the, the stars or the crosses are the workers. And when we silence the NeoFem4 gene, then actually uh, the particular hydrocarbon pattern of the queens changed, and, they, and it became more um, uh, worker-like. So there was then the shift to the field um, circles, so this um, really smelled um, like workers. So um, this then uh, made us believe that um, NeoFem4 is a crucial gene um, for the royalty scent in, um, in this termite species. We then, in the next step, wanted to look um, whether NeoFem4 interacts with JH, and therefore we measured, or 
um, Klaus measured it actually, um, the JH titer in, uh, in screens where we um, knock down the NeoFem 4 gene. And you see here the measurements again. Um, so, uh, and actually what you see after knocking down NeoFem 4, um, um, the JH titer is dropping drastically. So this implies that actually NeoFem 4 is somehow regulating the JH titers. We also did a reverse experiment where we knocked down or uh, down um, decreased the uh, JH titer using Bracrophane. And um, this works very well. Uh, when we apply Bracrophane in, uh, in our termites, then the JH titer um, goes down to almost zero. And then after Bracrophane treatment, we um, tested um, then the expression of NeoFem4. And what you can see here, there was no um, difference. Um, so that, that means that JH does not really influence um, the expression of NeoFem4, which confirms um, that NeoFem4 is probably upstream of um, JH um, in the regulating pathway. So um, from this, we could summarize or then come to the following model um, for NeoFem4 and the royalty sent <coughs> in Cryptothermis Secundus. So what we have, we have a NeoFem4, which is involved in producing um, the royalty sent. And NeoFem4 somehow interacts with the JH titer, and the JH titer is important for the fertility um, of the greens. And um, so, via this internal network, um, the, um, the green sand is produced and it characterizes a reproducing individual from a non-reproducing individual and it uh, probably also characterizes the fertility. And um, the workers can um, smell this with their antennae and therefore the reproductive division of labor um, is maintained um, in this colony. So in the next step, um, we then really wanted to test how widespread are our NeoFem4 genes. And we first did this in a closely related species, Cryptothermus cynocephalus, so from the same genus. And we did, in this experiment, we did the same experiment um, as in Cryptothermus secundus. So we did um, RDA experiments and identified overexpressed genes in greens of Cryptothermus secundus. And what was nice, is that we actually um, found that NeoFem 1, 2, and 3 are also overexpressed or, or female-specifically um, expressed in um, Cryptothermus cynocephalus um, as in Cryptothermus secundus. So these are neotenic females, neotenic males, and, and then the workers. But at the same time, we found many more genes in Cryptothermus cynocephalus which are um, 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 green specifically expressed. <coughs> in total, um, out of 13, uh, 13 out of 16 genes between both species were differentially expressed, and only NeoFem 1 to 3 showed a consistent pattern, which might indicate that they are um, more common green genes. More recently, we now looked um, how widespread our um, our green genes are also in other families, and this we could only do because of um, um, several genome sequencing projects. And um, the first genome that was um, published last year was Sotamopsis nevadensis, uh, and um, this termite um, is also an OP termite um, similar to our termite, um, but it's belonging to another um, family. And then the second genome, um, which was last year um, published, is um, Macrothermus natalensis. This is fungus growing um, termite, and it's belonging to the termitide. And um, by being involved in this project, we um, then could compare um, these, um, these two termites. And at the moment, we are having an ongoing genome project for our um, own species, Cryptothermus secundus. And when you now look at the behavior or at the social traits between these species, they are actually very, very different. So, um, so when you can say like to, uh, to Thermopsis nevadensis um, and Macrothermus natalensis, they are the opposite end of the sociality spectrum that you can find in termites. 
So, uh, so Thermopsis nevadensis has a social complexity. The developmental plasticity is high. Um, whereas in um, Macrothermis natalensis, which is a fungus growing termite, it is very complex. It has several um, um, casts. It is not um, developmental plastic and it reaches really um, high colony sizes. What is similar in both of these species is that the pathogen load um, is high. And when we compare it um, now to our um, termites, we have some similarities and some differences. So um, Cryptothermus secundus is in many aspects very similar to Thoroternobosis nevadensis. It is a wood dwelling termite, so it has a low social complexity, um, like to Macrothermus natalensis is sitting within the site, uh, with sitting within the site um, of its food and not never leaving it. Um, the developmental plasticity in Thoroternobosis nevadensis is similar to what I've shown you for Cryptothermus secundus. Um, so these species are really very similar in many, many aspects, but where they differ is actually in the pathogen, pathogen load and their Cryptothermus secundus is very unusual among termites in general because in most termites the pathogen load uh, is very high because the termites nest inside the soil and um, so they are always uh, in contact um, with pathogens and Cryptotherm uh, uh, so Thermopsis is not nesting inside the soil but also in, inside wood but it is nesting in decaying wood, so there's a high fungal load. And in contrast to this, Cryptothermus secundus is nesting inside wood, so it's not in contact with uh, any soil, uh, soil uh, pathogens, um, but it's nesting in sound wood, and therefore also the pathogen load is very low in Cryptothermus secundus. So um, what can we know? Yeah, um, some facts about the genome. Um, first, before I coming to the results. So, um, what you can see here, like, uh, is like, so Thermopsis nevadensis has the smallest genome known for any termite. So, like from the genome size, Cryptothermus secundus and Macrothermus natalensis are uh, typical. So, they have much larger genomes than the social hymenopterans have. This one gigabase. And um, all the genome um, sequencing was done in cooperation with BGI and uh, on a Illumina platform, which is very nice because therefore we can also compare um, the genomes. Um, here are some data about the quality of the genomes and what we have in addition to the genomes for Cryptothermus nevadensis and secundus is we have several transcript homes so that we can um, compare also expression. Patterns. So what are the results from this um, genome sequencing project with regard to our NeoFem um, genes? We actually could identify all our NeoFem Neo genes. Sorry. Um, in Cryptothermus, uh, in Zootermopsis and in Macrothermus natalensis. And we actually found some interesting pattern. And I will show you here this result for our P450 gene, which seemed to be involved in the communication and the production of the royalty scent. So um, this is a gene tree um, from our NeoFem4 gene. And what you can see here is nothing, because like always with these gene trees on the screen, you can see nothing. So I highlighted um, some of the group. So here you can um, see termite specific um, genes, then you can see um, uh, that one of the termite specific genes is closely related to Daphnia genes, then there is one, um, which one group which is more related here um, to holometabolin bolus insects and uh, to the hymenopterans, so the hymenopterans are actually sitting here. And um, then we have um, some groups, especially here and here, that seem to be rather um, termite or cockroach specific. And when we screen into um, the tree in more detail, um, this is actually where our NeoFem4 is located. Um, NeoFem4 is actually this um, gene. Then what you can see here is actually that Cryptothermus secundus, so our species has um, obviously species specific um, duplications um, of this P450 gene. Uh, you can just, 
And but it also has the closest ortholog is one from um, Zootermopsis nevadensis. And so Zootermopsis nevadensis has also some um, lineage or uh, species specific expansion um, of a P450 gene. And um, as this is all still not very, um, very clear to see, I um, will show you more details um, here. So what we found in Cryptotermus secundus is actually that we have a duplication of this, uh, of this gene, of this um, P450 gene, and here actually is our Neofem 4 gene. And this P450 gene is shared, so we have a close ortholog with um, Zootermopsis nevadensis, and uh, so Thermopsis nevadensis has its own duplication also of this P450 gene. And when we look now for macrothermus nutter lenses, um, it has its, uh, there is no close ortholog um, for, um, for our genes and also not for the P450s. It has its own um, duplications of this gene. And now when we look for the expression pattern, um, for Zootermopsis nevadensis and Cryptothermus secundus. Um, then we can see that the ortholog of our, uh, the closest ortholog or the closest um, gene for our P450 gene is um, also overexpressed in um, female reproductive. So you have here uh, the expression um, of this gene and here you have workers, then you have soldiers, here you have female reproductives and male reproductives, and what you can clearly see is um, that this um, gene is overexpressed in uh, neotenic, uh, yeah, in, in reproductives of Zootermopsis nevadensis. And uh, this is the ortholog of the gene of Zootermopsis nevadensis, and when you look at the expression pattern here, then you actually see that this gene, the real ortholog um, of Zootermopsis nevadensis is actually overexpressed in workers and not in queens. And um, we have one single sample transcript home sample um, of a non-reproducing um, queen and actually this also shows a higher expression. So this ortholog seems to be more characteristic or overexpressed in non-reproducing individuals in Cryptothermus secundus, whereas in Zootermopsis it is overexpressed um, in reproductive. And now, like our Neofem4 um, gene, there, as we have seen already before, this is really um, que uh, queen-specifically expressed and non not expressed in non-reproducing individuals. So from this, we could see that we obviously have duplications in the genomes of these termites, and we have caste-specific expressions of these genes, um, and, but that the caste specificity seems to be different um, when we compare Cryptothermus secundus with, uh, with Zootermopsis nevadensis. And when we now look um, for another of our Neofem um, genes, is Neofem 3. Neofem 3 is, um, is the vitalogenin, and here you have the gene tree um, of the vitalogenins in um, termites. There are actually um, four vitalogenins, um, but only two which have the whole three domains uh, for a vitalogenin. For a vitalogenin. <coughs> and um, these ones are the um, vit um, vitalogenin genes. Um, which have all three domains um, for vitalogenin. And when we look in detail again into these um, genes, um, which you can see here again, it is also that we have um, species-specific or lineage-specific um, duplications of these genes. And so, and here in this case, we have really um, close orthologs. So we have, um, this is um, the Cryptothermus secundus gene. We have a next close ortholog in uh, Zootermopsis nevadensis and Macrothermus nutter lenses. And um, the same for the, uh, the dupl duplicated um, gene. We also have um, um, close orthologs in both species. But what, what, what we can see in mac um, Macrothermus nutter lenses is that uh, um, this be uh, in macrothermus nutter lenses, there's actually only one domain of the three domains 
for vital lutenium. So there seem to be two losses of domains in macrothermal matter lenses. When we now look again at the expression pattern for zoothermopsis and for cryptothermal, um, then we can see here um, for zoothermopsis um, that actually both of these typical um, proper vitalogenin genes, they are overexpressed in female reproductive. And when we now look for cryptothermal secundus, then we can see uh, that actually one of these genes is overexpressed in female reproductive, so in queens. And this is actually our NeoFem3 gene, but um, the, du the duplicate of it, this is actually overexpressed in, in workers and less expressed in female reproductive. So here again, this suggests um, that we have duplicates um, within the termite or cockroach lineage. And these are differentially expressed between cast and the differential expression is different between the different species. So in the last part, I want to come um, to one or, um, other group of genes besides our neofem um, genes, and these are the immune genes. And I said that cryptothermus um, secundus and um, zoothermopsis nevadensis are very similar uh, when it comes to sociality and developmental plasticity, but they differ in pathogen load. And uh, the, the pathogen load in cryptothermus secundus is very low, and this is unusual um, for, um, for termites. And so uh, would, we would predict um, that in cryptothermus secundus, immune defense is less important than in the other two species. And actually, in general, immune defense is very important in termites um, because of the high pathogen load. And this was shown by several intensive studies um, already, and that there is selection on immune genes. When you now look in our um, genomes um, for the immune uh, genes, then we actually could identify all immune, gene, uh, all immune pathways in all three species, but we didn't find any enrichment. The only exception um, was for um, two categories of immune genes, and uh, this suggests, uh, in connection with the work done by all the other people, this suggests that actually there might be two types of defense in termites. And this uh, might depend on the nesting um, type of the termites. So uh, for one uh, defense, the gram-negative gram binding proteins, the GMBPs, um, seem to be very important. And this has been shown um, by Balmer et al. that they are very important because they have antifungicidal properties. And actually, when we look in zoothermopsis nevadensis, um, we found um, six GMBPs, which is highly or which is enriched, and um, where, but we find only two in macrothermus natalensis, because macrothermus probably has another type of immune defense for macrothermus as for other fungus-growing termites, probably um, antimicrobial peptides, um, AMPPs, seem to be more important, and especially um, termicines. And um, actually what we found, because there's also what has been shown that there's also selection on these termicines, and it has also been shown that there's selection on GMBPs in, um, in species um, like, uh, like Zoothermopsis nevadensis. So this, um, this leads us to expect that GMBPs are important for termites that nest in a nest that is enclosed and separated from the soil, whereas antimicrobial peptides are more pr probably more important in termites um, that have contact um, within the soil. And so from this, we can then make some predictions what we would expect for cryptothermal secundus. So in general, we would expect that immune defense in cryptothermal secundus is not that important it has, because it has a low pathogen load. Um, but as a wood dweller, we would expect that the immune uh, defense is more similar to Zoothermopsis nevadensis than it is to Macrothermus natalensis. So we would expect that there would be more GNBPs, but actually low um, antimicrobial peptides and um, few um, termicines. 
And when we looked in the genome, this is actually what we found. So um, we have only one antimicrobial peptide, no termicine, uh, but we have um, five GMVPs. And now in the final part, I would like to show you some results, more, more detailed results for the GMVPs, because I then also looked at the expression pattern in the different, uh, at the evolution and the expression pattern of the GMVPs in the termites. And here you can see a phylogeny uh, or a gene tree um, of the GNVPs. And um, what is marked are the termites. And um, for comparison, um, here are the hymenopterans. And what you can see here, or what, what you already might expect, that we have an expansion in the GMVPs in, in the termites, or maybe in the cockroaches, but we have no cockroaches at the moment. And when we look in detail, again, it is also the same as in the other termites. So we have um, species-specific expansions um, with close autologues um, between Zootermaxis uh, nevadensis and Cryptothermus secundus. And as you know, might already expect, when you look at the expression, um, different autologues um, of the same gene are differently expressed in the different cast, and it's different between Cryptothermus secundus and um, Zootanopsis. So here you can see um, the expression of one of the GMVP genes, and uh, in Cryptothermus secundus, this um, gene is overexpressed in um, equines, um, whereas the autolog in um, so, um, Zootermopsis nevadensis is overexpressed or seems to be overexpressed in workers. What I have to mention here, the sample size is um, very small. Okay, um, so again, the same pattern. Um, we have duplicates within the termites. Uh, they are differentially expressed between casts, and this differential X pattern is different between the species. So with this, I'm coming um, to the summary of my talk. And um, in the first part, I've shown you how genes and hormones interact in communication and how they might be important in maintaining the reproductive division of labor and the reproductive monopoly of um, the queen. And here we think juvenile hormone, the interaction of P450 with juvenile hormone is crucial in that it produces the royalty scent. This might be a signal for the worker um, for the fertility of the queen and is hence maintaining the reproductive monopoly within the colonies. So um, in the second part of the talk about um, the neofem genes, I could show you that we have could identify five neofem genes um, that they seem to be important in Cryptothermus secundus in maintaining the reproductive monopoly. And when we look for these genes in other termite species, we actually all find them. So I didn't show you the results for neofem 2 and 1, but there is, was exactly the same as for neofem 3 and 4, or similar to neofem 3 and 4. Also in neofem 1 and 2, um, these were tandem duplicates and um, um, of these genes, and these tandem duplicates were differentially expressed um, between the different termite species, or at the moment we can only say between uh, Cryptothermus um, secundus and Zootermopsis nevadensis. So this for us, um, these results, the last results which I've shown you from the gene trees are all very new. I just really analyzed them last week. Um, but I think they seem, seem to be quite interesting because it seems to indicate that actually that there have been lineage-specific expansions or duplication of genes, and these duplicates are used for social regulation in the termites. But then the regulation mechanism in the different species was different because in some it's um, one autolog expressed and the other is the other autolog that is expressed. So. Um, and this is just summarized here. So we have duplicated genes, all of the crucial genes um, which we looked at, we found duplicated genes. They were differentially expressed between casts, uh, but the cast specificity differed between the species. And with this, I'm at the end. 
I want to thank many um, co-operators um, and co-workers in this work. So all the genetic work actually started when I, while I was still in Regensburg with Michael Reilly from the medical department. Then Klaus Hartfelder, he did all the JH titer measurement. Um, Jürgen Liebig had the lead of the uh, Zootomopsis uh, nevadensis genome paper. Michael Paulson had the lead um, of the ma uh, Macrothermis um, natalensis genome paper. Erich Bornberg's Brower group is involved in all the um, um, bioinformatic analysis. Um, BGI, uh, we had several very good cooperations with, uh, with BGI that were very crucial for this project. And here are then um, the PhD students that are actually involved or were involved in this project. So like these are former PhD students with, which were more involved in the characterizing of the new FEM gene. Then Carsten Kamina is important or is the important person for uh, the cryptothermis uh, secundus um, gene. And Nicola Terrapon was um, the guy who had then the actual lead in Anna doing the bioinformatics and zootomopsis nevadensis. And Ann Katrin Hülsmann, um, she is actually he, she has done the gene trees of the most recent work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for the great talk. How do you know that uh, NeoFEM4 uh, is expressed in uh, on, on our site? Uh, we don't know that. Uh, so this was trust. Uh, we don't know that. So it's, um, it's everybody in the body, everywhere in the body, so in the abdomen, but we don't know whether it's expressed. This, this, this was trust to illustrate it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'll take two. Uh, you showed that there, has, there have been some duplication, for example, NeoFEM4, and so do you have some uh, information about why there have been those duplication? Are there uh, stage-specific uh, expression or things like that? No, at the moment we don't really don't know anything because I just did this analysis last week. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so it was really that we, I just found this duplication and found it quite interesting. And then also when I looked at the expression pattern that it's different between the different species. But I think this is something where we now start or can start to look how it is regulated and why it's different between the different species. Okay. I want to stay with this duplication. So um, there's two options, right? If there's a duplicated before speciation, happened, right, then there's a, basically a switch in function with speciation, or it had, I mean, duplicated after speciation, and then there are not true orthologs, right, mm -hmm. so then you are par dealing with paradox. Do you mm -hmm. have any insights in that? Yeah, we have some insights in that, and this is different for the different um, genes. So for NeoFEM4, um, which is the royalty scan gene, so there seem to be duplications after after separation, at least from um, um, zootermopsis, we don't know for the others. So this seemed to be more species specific. But some of the others seem to be um, termite specific and or cockroach specific. The problem is we don't have a cockroach genome, so we can't tell yet. But some of them seem to be rather, um, at the moment, species specific. So uh, for your uh, P450, you showed there are effects on JH levels and then also on cuticular hydrochrome levels. Do you think those are two independent pathways, or is it first affecting JH and then the cuticular hydrochrome um, levels? We are actually at the moment trying to um, figure Do this out. Um, I think they are not independent, so mm -hmm. they are um, somehow connected, somehow but we don't know So can know you, like, knock exactly. it down and then add yeah. JH and then, yeah. okay. <laughs> Well, Christina just stole my question, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just wondering about the beta glycosidase. I mean, this uh, this is, um, I mean, is it part? Do you think it's also affecting the insulin signaling pathway? Yeah. So we actually have some data on insulin signaling pathway, and there seem to be uh, an interaction between JH and the insulin signaling pathway. This has already um, been suggested by Toro Miura in one of his works, and um, they seem to be similar. Um, so the JH is interacting 
was in, so that seemed to be both ways. That it's up, uh, downstream um, of the insulin signaling pathway, but it's interacting also with the insulin signaling. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, I'm curious, uh, again, about the duplications, if you think that this is sort of the exception to the rule or the rule itself. Do you, if, you, if you were to look sort of throughout the genome, does it seem that these duplications are happening over and over again um, and sort of allowing the, the, the genes to, to specialize, or do you think that it's sort of in particular to the genes that you're looking at now? Um, well, at the moment, uh, um, I can't tell because these are really new results. But it was really striking for me that all the genes that were important, uh, which were known to be important in termites, actually had these duplications. And so the chances um, um, to just by chance to hit one, I think uh, this is no, uh, not just chance anymore, so there se probably seem to be some patterns. But the next step will, of course, be to look how often are duplications in general within the genome and to look for more genes and see whether this is always the pattern and this um, non-random pattern.